All right, and while people are still joining, I am actually going to open um, Grand Rounds today and introduce our speaker so that we have lots of time for her. Um, so welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, it's December the 12th, so we are approaching holiday season, and I think uh, everybody um, feels it in the air. But we're super excited um, to have a, a really um, uh, prestigious guest here today for, um, for Grand Rounds. Uh, about a topic that I know interests everybody um, on uh, Zoom today. So I'd lo love to introduce Dr. Karen DeSalvo, who's the Chief Health Officer at Google. She is a pra an internist, um, so near and dear to our heart, and a health leader working at the intersection of medicine, public health, and information technology. She's dedicated her career to improving health outcomes for all with a focus on solutions that address all the determinants of health, and you are sitting with a group who is very, very keyed into social determinants of health. She continues to be a powerful voice and advocate for limiting inequities and improving public health. She brings this lifelong commitment to Google where her team of health professionals provide guidance for the development of Google's research products and services, including those for Google's own employees and their family members. She served as health commissioner in post Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans, then as the national coordinator for health information technology and assistant secretary for health acting in the Obama administration. She was before that vice dean for community affairs and health policy at Tulane, and Chief of General Internal Medicine and Geriatrics. Dr. DeSalvo is on the Board of Directors for Welltower and the Council of the National Academy of Medicine. She co-convenes the National Alliance for the Social Determinants of Health with former HHS Secretary Michael Levitt. She served as the President of SGIM and Honorary Vice President of United States for the American Public Health Association. In 2021, she was named to the Business Insider's list of 100 people transforming business and has repeatedly been included on the list of modern healthcare's 100 most influential people in healthcare. She earned her MD and MPH here in the Southeast from Tulane University and her master's in clinical epi from the Harvard School of Public Health. So I think Dr. DeSalvo, we often um, don't think about people in technology as being um, not only internists, but internists who are, again, very interested in healthcare inequities and really um, understand the um, full gamut of, um, of health in the United States. And so um, your background's super exciting, and I actually may have a question for you about that uh, at the end, but um, I don't want to delay, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for, uh, for having me. I really appreciated uh, you and Carlos asking, and it does feel a little bit like I'm transported near to home um, today. I'm, I'm based in California now, and um, the Southeast is near and dear to my heart, as is Emory and lots of friends there, um, especially in the GIM world. So hello to everybody um, and to some of the folks that that um, we are trained or trained with uh, at, at Tulane, who I know are, are on the on the, um, the Zoom today. I'm going to um, uh, to walk us through um, today why Google's in health and um, how we think about health, um, how we're using AI to address the multiple determinants of health, including information as a determinant of health, and talk about the opportunity and responsibilities that we're seeing in this next generation of AI, which is an incredibly exciting and transformational time, not only in tech, but also for the health of people all around the world. Before I do that, I just want to um, make sure I, I mention my conflicts, which um, I'm on the board of uh, directors for a company called Welltower. That's a healthcare REIT. Um, we do senior housing and, and uh, other, other um, real estate in that area. I also formerly on the board of Humana, and I still have uh, equity in that company. And of course, I'm an employee of Google. So let's start with why Google is in health. You know, Google is um, a life company. We're actually not a healthcare company, and it's one of the things that attracted me to come here is because health happens all across our lives, not just in those times when we're in the clinic or in the hospital or on a telehealth visit. And in our, our founding letter, our CEO said that when we say helpful, we mean giving people the tools to increase their knowledge, success, health, and happiness. And we've always had some ways that we've worked in health, um, but uh, when I joined the company four years ago, we were just launching this new chapter of really formalizing uh, the ways we worked across the company. And indeed, um, the pandemic happened just a few weeks after I joined the company. And it was a really um, eye-opening experience for me, certainly. And I think for some others here at the company about how much people turn to us for information when there's a crisis, but also in everyday expectations. We have about 
um, about half a billion people that come to us on a daily basis asking questions across all of our platforms. Um, one of those um, is, is search. And during the pandemic, we saw this big spike in interest uh, early around coronavirus, which later um, um, people began to search on as COVID. And, um, and then over time, you can see in this, uh, this second graph that depending upon where we were in that pandemic, people were looking for things like testing. Uh, later, they had a big spike when they were looking for finding a vaccine near them. And th this helped us to really think about our uh, opportunity to partner with public health around the world, beginning with the World Health Organization, but then also thinking about those local entities, whether it's the CDC or the state of Georgia, where, or even down to the city and county level, how could we help amplify uh, those messages? So instead of us providing you know, the, the factual information about COVID to be able to point people uh, to the direction of where they could find that high quality information, I think this this journey in COVID also helped us understand that um, though it was really important that we do work in AI to support physicians and the healthcare system, some work I'll talk about in a minute, um, consumers are um, a really important responsibility, including seeing that they have high quality information and that we have ways to address um, harmful misinformation. At Google, um, we have a very consumer-oriented uh, approach to health and healthcare. Um, we um, believe that the future of health is consumer-driven, that they are expecting a mobile-first, anticipatory, and personalized experience for their health needs. And that means that healthcare systems, uh, all enterprises involved in, in helping people with their health will need to evolve um, to meet people um, where they are with these more personal and personalized insights, um, but with high quality uh, equitable services. And in fact, um, it, it's actually very much the way that, especially even since the pandemic, people are increasingly uh, going mobile first uh, for telehealth visits. They're doing much more self-directed care. Think about home tests for COVID as a way people got used and comfortable to being able to understand their own health needs. And, and there are more and more options uh, like that for people out in the ecosystem. And even the way people are, um, are accessing vaccines, uh, they're increasingly going to their neighborhood um, drugstore rather than um, actually going into the healthcare system. It's sort of all in service to, to them uh, being able to get the health services that meet the needs of their work, their school, their personal life, um, and making that as convenient and accessible as possible, but also focusing on quality and equity. We think that we have an opportunity at Google to be helpful as people are, are um, either trying to get healthy or stay healthy. Um, and there's a, a few reasons for that. One is we already have a relationship um, with people around the world, not only in the US, but um, in, every, in, in, in every part of the, the planet. And people are coming to us asking us questions about their health every day. Um, we also have platforms that are available to consumers and to the healthcare sector, whether that's Android, uh, an open source platform on phones, um, or cloud, which is uh, principally available to healthcare systems. We have a very AI first um, approach with capabilities in um, not only AI, but related ML and these new large language models which um, make, can, can stand to make care much more efficient, um, a higher quality, effective, and augment services that are being provided by healthcare, not replace them, but, but fill gaps in capacity or capability. And then we have a very inclusive ethos. Uh, our, our, our design, you know, our, our initial mission is um, to democratize access to the world's health information. And uh, so democratizing access to health is something that we firmly believe in here at the company. We're building for everyone everywhere, not some people in some places. And we have inclusion by design um, in many of our product areas, whether that's uh, photos uh, uh, or phones, uh, but also the way we think specifically about, about building uh, supports and services around health. We also have a, a way of working at the company where we have an enterprise-wide approach. We don't have a specific unit working on health. We actually um, build it uh, in, into our health products all across the company, those that are principally used by consumers like Search and YouTube or Maps or hardware, uh, phones and watches, and then um, also in, in cloud as examples of areas where we're building health use cases. And we, we look for ways um, to, to mutually reinforce those, those products. And in fact, that's uh, principally a part of my role as the chief health officer. This is a new role that we created when I joined the company four years ago. And um, the, the, it is designed to sort of help embed health use cases into all of our products to meet people where they're already engaging with us every day, 
to um, create a reliable, consistent, and scalable approach um, through a global expertise team that has clinical expertise, regulatory, um, I have an industry solutions team, and we also have um, a health equity team. This is um, designed to say that if we're gonna address things like mental health, there'll be a consistent approach um, that, that that people will experience as they're using our products across the company. And part of my role is also to coordinate um, across those different product areas so that we can be as mutually reinforcing as possible. We um, bring to this work, this philosophy that health is more than healthcare. Health, great healthcare matters, um, but and they're also non-medical and contextual drivers of health, the social determinants of health. Um, and we also believe strongly in, the in, in information uh, as, a, as a determinant of health. We're working holistically on physical, emotional, and social well-being and uh, build with equity and privacy by design, um, seeking to make a, a decisions uh, and products built on the most rigorous evidence that is possible. It's um, uh, the role that me and my health team have here at the company varies based upon how busy the product area is. and. Um, this is uh, this in the prior slide uh, are from a paper that I published uh, last spring with uh, my chief clinical officer, Michael Howell, that just describes the spectrum of how, how we engage. And we've certainly been evolving um, over time, moving from more ad hoc advising to thinking about how we can do be more involved in co-creation and leadership. But this will vary depending upon how busy the product area is in health. Um, and um, and certainly the, the type of service that we're providing. For example, sometimes um, it just makes sense to provide ad hoc uh, product safety advice as they're thinking about the early part of the product uh, roadmap or uh, provide a center of expertise in health equity uh, for all the product areas. Sometimes I need to have a clinician uh, at the elbow of engineers um, right in the front lines uh, in places like, like Search or, or on Fitbit. We uh, work in a way that we call our three C's. Um, we have three uh, groups, uh, three, three ways that we think about building products and, and services and, and, and research. Consumers, caregivers, and communities, and AI really underpins all of this work um, and, ha and has for some time. I'll give you some examples in each of these areas um, just to give you a flavor of the way health manifests um, here at the company. Starting with um, consumers, um, let, let's just think about the search surface and um, ways that we can um, help people uh, not only find information uh, uh, on a health topic, but also do some self-assessment and then um, actually help them navigate on their health journey. So on this panel on the left, this is what we call a knowledge panel. And when people search on a topic, um, there will be a, essentially a, think of it like a mini pamphlet that that pops up onto the screen. This is one on post-traumatic stress disorder that was made by the, the National Health Service in the UK. And it provides um, a snapshot of the, of the quality information that, that people might need on PTSD. And then they can click on the link and learn more directly uh, from the, the National Health Service. This is the kind of thing we would offer in a geographies all around the world with authoritative organizations that resonate with the population uh, in, in those communities. In the middle, in the middle bucket, um, you see a self-assessment. So this is a way that people um, in some areas, like uh, mental health, can um, take a take a standardized survey that um, is available from from an entity like, for example, the CDC, and uh, answer questions about their own health. We're not collecting this information, but rather this takes people to, in this case, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, where they can where they can learn more and then navigate um, to find uh, help from those sites if, if, uh, if warranted. And in the final bucket is a, an example of how we can intervene in crisis. Um, we don't always respond um, to, to people's requests for information, especially if it's life and death. For example, in the case of, of suicidality, we would want to um, help uh, people to know that there is help available. So uh, through AI, we can, we can determine based on what people are putting into the search bar, oh, this sort of points towards someone who might be um, at risk. Let's help elevate information for them. And we can pop up, as you see in this um, crisis hotline demo, um, 988, which is the number to call in the US. 
not everybody wants to call. Some people want to do a chat um, with a with a bot, and some people want to text um, with with um, with an organization to get support and help. And then we can help link them also to those organizations um, for for help and support. So these are examples of how we we not only push forward high quality information in partnership with authoritative groups, help people learn more about their own health again in partnership with authoritative organizations. But sometimes we want to interrupt. Um, um, the, interrupt the search because it seems that there's a life and death situation. And um, certainly um, some of the mental health areas are an important priority area for us. We have some similar ways that we do this in on YouTube, um, not only for highlighting authoritative sources, um, but also to support creators to make more engaging content. Um, uh, some populations like global youth really want shorter videos. So we're using AI to help shorten um, videos and or to, to improve sort of the quality of the content. And for example, we can use AI on YouTube to, to translate content uh, for global viewers. Um, one of the um, important new opportunities for large language models uh, is, to, is to have that translate function so that information in places like India, where there are multiple um, uh, languages that are official languages, and, not, and though everybody may you know, speak in, and um, understand English and Hindi, not everybody reads and writes. So how, what are the ways that we can um, improve access to information YouTube is a place where we also have latitude to work more directly with creators to create content. Say we see gaps in information in a topical area like uh, nutrition, and we want to work with creators around the world to, to provide high quality information in that space. One of the things we did on YouTube um, is work with the National Academy of Medicine and ask them to, to, to provide some, some guidance around a framework for how to know if, if an organization, an individual um, was going to be high quality. So we weren't deciding what was quality information, uh, but rather, um, are they an accrediting organization, uh, say, um, uh, like the, the, um, the, the American Board of Internal Medicine? Um, do they um, have other ways that they provide uh, cred credentials to, to clinicians like CMSS? And what are ways that we can show that people are, are, for example, clinicians are licensed? In some some geographies like the UK, we can do the National Health Service and have them do um, a check mark essentially to say this is a video where um, the NHS says this is um, high quality information. We can also create things like a health shelf. So when people are searching on a topic, uh, the next the next videos that pop up will be a part of a corpus of high quality videos that have have sort of been through this um, authoritative health labels process. Here, I want to give a few examples um, for caregivers in the healthcare system. This is a, um, honestly one of the uh, most most uh, historic areas uh, uh, that that Google and Health have worked on. We have such a deep bench of, of research scientists and so many people um, working in research who have been interested um, in, in AI, particularly to improve diagnostics and therapeutics. Uh, for example, uh, work in augmenting accuracy of, of reading things like mammograms um, or helping to prioritize um, high-risk high uh, individuals or films, in this case, for, for identifying multidrug resistant TB in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, or to improve uh, an e-screening uh, in, in parts of the world where there are uh, capacity gaps for things like um, interventional ophthalmologist and screening for diabetic retinopathy, and then ways that um, we can help augment um, expert capabilities. So, uh, for example, we have worked, we've worked with Mayo to create um, a, a tool for radiotherapy for head and neck cancer to, to better a contour and identify healthy um, and diseased tissue to reduce the time for, from diagnosis um, uh, to, to actual treatment for individuals. And then I'll give an example um, of work in communities, thinking about the context in which people live, learn, work, and play, and some of the challenges that they face in those areas. And uh, the example here is something that we call Flood Hub. And this work uh, dates back uh, now about five years of us um, being able to use some of the information we have from maps, but other sources and anonymized uh, information that we can use to look for uh, lo local risk and things like fire. In this case, it's for flood. And we can, um, with, with people's uh, consent, send them notifications about um, impending risk from things like um, flood in their area. And as um, helpful as we hope all that has been for um, consumers and caregivers and communities, um, there is a really exciting new generation of AI that's um, opening up some possibilities that 
have made it a um, pretty exciting year here at Google. Um, and I think are, are opening us up to thinking about how we could even do even more in partnership with healthcare systems and governments and, and individuals around the world um, to help people. This uh, idea of large language models, which see patterns um, in words and increasingly in other um, kinds of, of data um, or generative AI where, where these models actually create new content based upon that um, isn't a new idea. If you think about Smart Compose, um, when you're typing a text or an email, that is a large language model that's doing autocomplete. Um, it's similar for tools that people use like uh, Google Translate um, or even um, some of the, the tooling that is available in, in um, photos like Magic Eraser. So this is technology that's been part of um, sort of background daily life tools, but has, has in, uh, significantly improved in the capabilities in the past couple of years and is now um, increasingly being used in a very um, forward-leaning way, uh, particularly um, in some of the information professions uh, like medicine. A lot of testing and learning and um, 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 conceiving of what might be possible because um, this sort of new step change capabilities that the generative AI models have um, certainly seem to have some applicability to the daily work that, that we have in, in medicine, but also in other sectors that affect health like public health. Uh, the, these models can be good at um, interpreting complex questions, um, understanding context, and, and not only translating, but also putting that context um, in, the, into the language that someone's, someone's asking the question. They're able to, to do this in a way that's increasingly multimodal, so text, images, uh, audio as a way to interpret inputs and also respond to those. Um, they're... Um, as many of you may have experienced, they give uh, plausible answers and, and can be interactive in a way that, that feels almost um, uh, like it's from a person, though it is a machine and not a person. Uh, they, they can generate um, new things like um, text, sonnets, um, videos, music, um, and um, can do that in a way that can be um, um, shaped by the prompt. So can you write this as if you were a PhD candidate or can you change the, the, um, the reading level to sixth grade reading level to make it more accessible, say to the, the patient when you're sending them a letter and um, certainly for advancing discovery in a number, in a number of areas. Um, I, I think for me, the, the opportunity here seems to be that for the first time in my career, I can actually imagine a world where Everyone everywhere, uh, no matter where they live, the color of their skin, uh, their personal characteristics will have access to the highest quality, most affordable, equitable care imaginable and, and have that evidence reach them, not over 17 years, but right away because it's um, there, there's a way to augment and support um, the clinician right there in the moment of care with the best evidence, but also the best knowledge about that person in front of them so the clinician can use that in their judgment to make the decisions um, about the care. It's also, I think, uh, I hope for me that this makes the care more personalized uh, for individuals and that it brings back joy to medicine. There's this whole array of thinking that that I, I, I hope over the next you know decade will consider applying generative AI to things like avoidable afford, um, avoidable deaths or so minimal mortality because so there's so many ways to think about improving access not only to higher quality care, care in general, um, but also um, helping people to navigate and remember to, um, or, or, or not even just remember, but to facilitate and ease things like preventive care, pap smears, mammograms, uh, vaccines, and, and really begin to um, bring health span back to people all around the, on the planet. Just a, a synopsis of sort of the thinking there is, you know, what are the, the problems that we face, not only in the US, but around the world? These are very common challenges that I hear when I'm traveling and visiting um, uh, in, a, in other places. In fact, I was just um, most recently in Europe, very similar themes, um, uh, India, um, other, it just, it, it, so I think these are for us global um, opportunities for, for this next generation of AI to help in things like workforce burnout and shortages to fill capacity and capability gaps, reduce cognitive load, to address cost, to reduce the cost of care episodes, Maybe, maybe for a dollar, um, people can access uh, primary care um, and reduce the development of non-communicable disease, uh, to reduce waste in the system, to automate redundant processes and, and reduce the, uh, the clerical burden, to drive equity and make care more culturally and linguistically appropriate um, and, and address bias and care. And um, 
address things like variability in quality where um, there's sort of, uh, for example, near zero cost for a curbside consult or a second opinion and um, helping us as clinicians to think about, um, you know, what is the next best action? What is the um, opportunity to address lack, lack of access? So how might extensions of physicians um, or upskilling of community health uh, workers in the field be supported by generative AI? And um, how can we address things like inconvenience for people where they, they don't know how or where to access the services they need and, and what kind of personal health agents might, might emerge um, from health systems that wanna support the people they're serving? Um, and um, care right now can be a little generic, um, including recommendations for screening um, or for, for, care, for care plans, but uh, over time, Generative AI will help make care more personalized um, and uh, perhaps even help us have empathy at scale. This is a future thinking. There's, there's not a set of products today that can do this, but it's the way that I hope we'll all begin to, to think about the opportunity to serve the, the people around the world that we are here to, to drive health for, um, but also um, include them uh, in this as, as we think about the, the problems to solve that might, um, again, um, help everyone everywhere have longer, longer health span. I'll give you three examples um, uh, from, from uh, Google that we're working on. And um, these are um, in, in various stages of, of being uh, research and product. I'd say um, caveat here is most of this is very early um, in, in, in all the world of generative AI. We have a lot to learn um, as we, we seek to solve um, challenges. And we'll talk a bit about responsibility um, before I end my talk today. Um, I think you know one example to call out is in sort of um, the the ways that generative AI is going to help in areas like structural biology, and uh, we we um, announced uh, something called AlphaFold, which is deep learning for protein folding, and it's a way that essentially um, taking taking what used to be one PhD a student an entire PhD to to understand protein folding now can be done in seconds, and um, DeepMind is actually um, um, published the protein folding for 200 million um, proteins and made that publicly available. And we have researchers around the world that are using this to accelerate um, understandings, including um, new drug development. We're using this uh, for information as a determinant of health. <clears throat> and we have a few countries where um, we've started uh, what we call search generative experience. It's available here in the U.S. And um, it's a way that we can take those uh, blue links and, and some of the other information that would surface when, when people would search, turn that into a paragraph, but very importantly, um, be able to uh, link to the source of the information. So here's an example of how that little arrow that you see um, uh, that's now pointing up, when you click on it, it would close, but you can open it and find the, the source of this, this, these, uh, this, these first two sentences or three sentences are from the NIH and from the Cleveland Clinic so that people actually know what the grounding is and the factuality. And we're using this to um, you know, sort of improve information quality, multimodal, voice to text, multiple languages. I mentioned some of those, particularly as we're thinking um, a, a, about things like um, YouTube as an important messenger platform that, that many people, especially global youth, um, uh, seek information on. And the final example um, is about um, uh, MedPalm, which is a domain-specific large language model that we first uh, published about uh, uh, just about a year ago. And it is essentially a, it's a suite of medically tuned models that combine what, what large language models can do, the foundation models, with medical knowledge and um, allows the, the technology to essentially have gone to medical school and um, be able to do things like answer medical questions, summarize medical information, generate insights from unstructured data and um, it, more capabilities that we're, we're learning about and that we're working with partners on um, to test and learn over time. We published this um, last year in December that um, it was able to pass a, a medical licensing exam style question, essentially a, a, a version of the US MLE. This is a grand challenge in the AI world. And we were the first to accomplish that within a, a very few months, we were able to go from 67.2% pass rate to an 86.5. Um, pass rate, and we've made this available as an API, so customers have access to the technology through cloud for test and learn. It's not being used for clinically facing uh, services, but rather more for back office things like summarizing a note um, or um, doing some some uh, sort of clerical tasks. And 
we, we've talked about some of these uh, publicly. You're going to hear more in the next few weeks about how some of the partners that we have are, are make, taking advantage of the technology to see if it can be helpful as they move to productizing and making it a part of the work that they do uh, uh, on the front lines. Uh, one of our partners is Bayer, Pharm uh, Bayer Pharma, who's working to improve clinical trial processes, some of the um, paperwork pieces, regulatory filings, but also thinking about how it can um, do things like uh, address equity in, in clinical trials. Meditech, um, uh, an EHR provider, is using it for things like search and summarization to present information to the clinician as if the world's best uh, medical student or intern had done that for you. Um, and uh, then also Apollo, Apollo Hospitals, uh, based in India, is using it um, as a sort of an intake for their, their uh, telehealth platform, again, just sort of collecting information from the patient and presenting that to the clinician uh, for, for use in the clinical environment. Again, every, there, these are examples around the world of how um, um, this technology is, is being tested to see how it can be helpful um, in sort of everyday work. We've been continuing in the background, the scientific advancement of it, working on things like multimodal, um, is sort of uh, kitschy, but um, you know, how do you have a conversation with a chest X-ray? So um, this is a way that, that generative AI is using uh, capabilities of, of um, computer vision to think about the film and interact with the clinician. Uh, we also uh, recently published a paper that um, showed that um, in, in a research setting that it improves um, uh, the capability of clinicians to, to come up with an accurate uh, differential diagnosis. This was a paper where we um, uh, tested the large language model um, to in, in, um, in doing the diagnosis for CPCs from the New England Journal of Medicine. And we're going to have some more work in this area, again, as we're learning the capabilities of the model and thinking about um, how it might be useful to partners um, um, or to, 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 to those around the world who are seeking to improve health. But um, I just want to emphasize that this is um, an example of how of why we're early in large language models, because we're still learning the underlying science, just as people are learning about how they're useful in the ecosystem. And I think it just highlights um, uh, a point I want to make, which is for us, especially for uh, me and a lot of my team, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to first do no harm. And I'll give you some examples of, of what we mean by that. It's, it's not that the models aren't really helpful and quite capable, but it's also true that um, uh, we want to make sure that we're being responsible as we test and learn and, and start to roll these out uh, with partners or on our own products like Search. We, we talk about this um, about uh, as a sort of framework of being bold and responsible um, to having the right guardrails to protect users and society and doing this collaboratively, not only um, as we work with, with partners to understand how the models perform um, in the real world, if you will, or even though it's a test case, but um, also how, how, how we should all be thinking about regulation and oversight, because this is a first time uh, for the world to really think about how we're going to know what the, the appropriate guardrails are. Uh, I've written about this recently, if you if you want to pull this, this keyword blog, but I think essentially the optimism uh, needs to be coupled with, with making sure that we're, we're putting in the, the, the right oversight and guardrails in place. We think, frankly, that um, AI, uh, generative AI in particular, is, is, is just too important not to regulate. And so we've been very actively working not only with governments like the U.S. government, um, providing information when they, when they ask, but also uh, working with others like the National Academy of Medicine, Bipartisan Policy Center, those are examples here in the U.S., to try to come to a, a shared understanding of, of what are the ways that we want to make sure that these tools do good um, and that we mitigate uh, any potential challenges. This has been a priority for us at Google for uh, quite a while. Going back to 2018, we laid out our AI principles. As I mentioned at the top, we're using AI in our products already. So we needed to already think about how they were going to, how AI was going to be uh, used in a way that was socially beneficial, was not going to create or reinforce unfair bias, uh, be built and tested for safety, be accountable uh, to people, uh, therefore human in the loop, um, incorporate privacy by design. Um, uphold the standards of scientific excellence that we would want um, to, to be available in all of our products um, and to be uh, made available for uses that, that accord with these principles. We would ask this also um, of our partners who work with us uh, in this work. I'll just call out a couple of areas um, that, that come up a lot um, and are, I think, important in medicine. Uh, one is that 
large language models aren't actually just retrieving medicine. They're, they're lousy. They're actually trying to predict the next word and, and, and uh, sometimes squishing together um, information that they find um, out there, but they're generating sort of what might be the next thing in, in a word sequence or in an uh, increasingly like in a code sequence or an image sequence. That means just sometimes that they're kind of guessing um, and um, that it, it may make them hallucinate. So if they think that there should be a manuscript or a newspaper article, sometimes they'll generate one uh, even when it doesn't exist. This is a very hot area of work um, for the, the basic scientists that are working on improving the generative AI models to see that um, they're more grounded. It's especially important in medicine because you want to know the sourcing uh, of, the, of the recommendations. Uh, Equity, uh, also an incredibly important area, uh, important area for the company in general, um, important to me. Um, it's one of the teams that I created when I joined, uh, which was a health equity team to help us um, have equity by design uh, in our product areas. And it's a way that it's a, just like the AI principles and, and ethics around it are an important filter that we use at the company as we think about um, how we can be helpful with these with AI and now generative AI. We also um, run it through a health equity lens. You know, medicine. Um, we all I think we all know that some of the basic algorithms in science are biased. Some of them are very racially biased. So the data into the models is can be flawed, which means the output can be flawed. So working on uh, addressing that in the model so it drives equity, doesn't exacerbate inequities, uh, is a really high priority for us. I think I'll just end um, uh, by saying that as exciting as, as these as AI is, as, uh, as helpful as it is um, for people and for healthcare systems, and we hope for communities and public health, uh, at the end of the day, health is human. This technology needs to have human in the loop. Um, not only as it's being deployed and used, but um, uh, I still believe that there's so much more to medicine than just um, math, um, that it's also um, important to have human touch, to, under to be able to understand context. And a lot of medicine doesn't have always a neat answer. So we have to use a, a lot of judgment. The second um, is just an, a message, I think, especially to the next generation of clinicians um, that this is happening. Um, it's it's certainly uh, seems to not be a blip that we're building it into our core products like search um, and YouTube. We're seeing a lot of interest across many sectors, not just healthcare, and in ways that it can be uh, helpful in, in the broader world. And um, so it's going to happen. But what what I would hope is that AI should happen with healthcare, not to healthcare which means it's important for all of us to get smart about it, what it can do, what it can't do, what are the important characteristics that we need to, to be watching out for, what are the ways that we can help to see how it can be deployed to the highest and best uses to not only improve um, the practice of medicine, the joy of medicine, but ultimately to improve health for everyone everywhere all around the planet. And with that, I will close and uh, take time for some questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Um... There are a number of questions that I've been fielding. Uh, but before I give you sort of more concrete questions, um, can can you tell us a little bit about like your journey from um, New Orleans to this space, from being an internist and the you know head of SGIM to, to where you are now? I think a lot of people are very interested in different kinds of careers in medicine. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll start by saying, Wendy, that I loved practicing medicine. And I certainly got a really uh, quick um, jump in the deep end for that. I was National Health Service Corps Scholar. And so when I finished my chief residency, I um, started practicing at Charity Hospital in New Orleans. We had a faculty practice there. And so I had um, a full practice. And I, I remember when I, I, I was starting in the summer and and I told the, the clinic, you know, um, maybe we should go ahead and open open my panel so that I'll have patients to see when I start on July 1st. And as soon as they opened opened the scheduling book, it was full because it was Charity Hospital. I mean, like there were a lot of people who needed care. And so I was, I, I just, man, the, the education that I got so fast from my patients about what the real things that were going on in their life. It's very different when you're, when I was a resident and sort of the way that you see patients in that environment, as you get into having a longitudinal relationship with your patients and the more they trust you, the more they start to really share the reality of what's happening in their life. 
And I found um, that they were, they were knowledgeable about their health conditions. It was that they had um, life barriers to actually getting access to healthy food and having a safe place to live or exercise. And that they, um, I mean, life was getting in the way. I don't know any other way to say it. And it, it really sparked for me this notion that systems matter. It's not just what I do in that moment with my patient, but the environment in which I'm practicing, the health payment environment, um, and the the context in which we're all living, the community is really important. And I, Wendy, I think those are um, that kind of explains the way that as I thought about um, getting more involved in um, health system um, administration, the research I did in, in um, care quality and access to care, and when when Katrina happened in 2005. It was a, um, there was a question call for me as a person that, that was I um, going to put down my pencils on my, my academic work and think about community or, or try to make change more in the academic world? And there's no right answer there because lots of people made different choices. But for me, I felt like I could do more good by stepping out of um, sort of the traditional way I was doing research and academics and step into community because it's where my my heart was pulling me because um, I knew that there was a lot as, as we rebuilt that city we'd need to rebuild it with physical mental and social health in mind and I would need to work with a lot of other sectors um, to get that work done technology emerged for me in that time as a really important way to understand needs of individuals and and, and community and do better policy and planning i i, I tell students a lot um, that i was a very um i'm a reluctant leader i was not so much after katrina i ran straight into that fire or flood if you will um but but i think in many of the roles that i've had i think in, as initially presented like being the being the national coordinator for health IT, uh, I initially thought I actually said no. I don't don't think that's a job for me. I'm a community health person. But um, Kathleen Sebelius, who was the secretary at the time, was very uh, convincing. She said, "Karen, the future is how we're going to apply technology and information to improve health. You've been doing that in New Orleans. Come help us think about doing that um, as, uh, for the country." And um, I. I'm glad that I said yes, because it really opened up a, a way for me to think about blending the worlds of medicine, technology, and public health, bringing the best of all that to bear um, to, to um, help uh, improve people's health. The most important thing, Wendy, is the journey is what matters. There's not, there's not a checkbox of things that people should do. There was no Google when I was a resident. So I've just been trying to help people's health. And um, as I've sort of figured out how to do that through different systems, um, it, as we say in California at scale, um, that, that sort of let me here. But it's really, as I said at the top of my talk, one of the things I have learned um, from my patients, um, from all the roles that I've had, is that life is where health happens, not the healthcare system. And so the more that I can be helpful in this sort of everyday people's lives um, with health-infused decisions, et cetera, that those are those are ways that that I'm I'm really passionate about being being there for them in a way I couldn't always like follow my patient out the door and be with them as they were uh, doing their grocery shopping or whatever. Those are ways that we might be able to to be helpful. Now that um, rings very true to me in my outpatient practice at Grady. Um, I have more I could ask you there, but I'm going to actually shift to some of the um, other questions come up. You know, so even when we talked before you gave this talk and you addressed it a couple of times in different ways during your talk, but I think medical misinformation is at the front of everyone's mind all of the time, particularly post COVID. And that you, know, you mentioned, you know, using vetted sources like the Cleveland Clinic or NIH sources, but, um, uh, or, um, or having, you know, videos that are known to be high quality, but you can't probably have an army of people. Maybe you do have an army of people looking over all of those things. So, um, so, you know, some of the misinformation has clearly been perpetuated by search engines, particularly again, during, we saw that during COVID. So how, again, can you address even more how Google sort of battles healthcare misinformation, especially in areas of emerging research, um, like we saw in the pandemic and I remember yeah. all that. It was, it, um, it was such, a, um, so, so I joined the company uh, just prior to the pandemic and part of the, the work that I was um, coming to do was, um, 
to stand up um, what we call a health vertical in, in areas like YouTube, um, help address uh, search high quality information. So I, I share that to say that, that this is a relatively new formalized approach that we have. The pandemic um, really accelerated um, the, our learnings and the way that we work with others. So as awful as, the, as COVID was for so many people, it was helpful for us to shape out the way that we would think about information. But it was also a lot of testing. I want to, I want to be clear on a couple of things um, for, the, for folks. One is that search is, um, we should think of search more like a pamphlet that's kind of generic and static. It's the message. And we have a lot of restraints in the way that we can address information on the surface. Um, YouTube, we have more flexibility because we can work with content providers and address things like the messenger. So it's not just the message, it's who's delivering it and how can people find a, a trusted source. It might be a sports figure, it might be a musician that that will resonate with them, right? Instead of having to, to build that trust. On the search side, uh, really on both, um, we, we take an approach that's tried and true in public health, which is to um, flood with high quality information. So that, that's a, a risk communication approach in public health. That's a philosophy. So um, content forward is an example. I showed the knowledge panel. That's a way that when people search on a topic, we can immediately pop up. This is this is what you know the CDC says. This is what the Mayo says. Um, this is this is the the high quality uh, information that we want you to see. We can also do things with like dyad. So other people also ask these questions and then drop downs to find to find the the additional options. Um, in COVID, we had a lot on the on the home page. Um, we, we we tend to back off of that because um, users don't really people using the platform don't like a lot of clutter. So that's content forward. Um, we can we can address um, harmful misinformation. We have something we call community guidelines. That if 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 the evidence if there's an evidence base to say that um, a a practice is harmful from a morbidity or mortality standpoint, then we can pull down that, that harmful misinformation. We have more latitude to do that on YouTube than we do on search. Think of search as like a library. And um, the, the, um, the issue in, in the pandemic, particularly around misinformation, was, was difficult on surfaces like YouTube uh, because there might be a, a discussion. Um, maybe there was a grand round and people were talking about ivermectin. And, and debating it. So, so it, it, one of the tools that we can try to use for misinformation is AI to, to uh, listen to the video um, and identify these are, these are um, this is something that's popping up that seems to be in the realm of harmful misinformation. I do have um, um, physicians on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, who are available to watch a video if it's kind of in the margin um, so that they, they, they can try to understand what this a particular issue might be. It means uh, we have to uh, review the literature um, and uh, literally do a lit search and see if there's information in the space because lots of new things pop up all the time. Um, and so in that sort of gray zone, we're trying to make a determination about is this helpful debate or is this um, actually harmful misinformation? There's clear evidence that it's you know harmful, so we should pull it down. There's a lot of stuff in that middle in that middle space. And that's where I think especially, um, again, going back to the high quality, it's not because Google said this is good quality. We want it to be because the academic or medical community says this is high quality. And again, flood as much of that as we can for people so that, that that's the thing that they're, that they're able to, act, to access. We're really grateful to the partners that we have that are in that space that are, you know, um, like CMSS or American College of Physicians that sort of will do that, that help to help label, because um, then we can focus more on, on the misinformation side. Just a word, Wendy, that the, the thing about, one of the things I didn't talk about, but with um, generative AI is I'm um, concerned about, about disinformation. So not misinformation, but actually per perpetuating um, harmful disinformation, including in video. So watermarking is an important um, um, thing that we've said as a company we're going to do so people will know this video or this image was made with generative AI um, and to begin to help people learn to navigate what's going to be, a, I think, a, an even bigger challenge in, in the future because it'll be easier to kind of perpetuate that kind of information. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah, no, it is. It is a fear. Um, here um, from our uh, uh, resident room, um, in you, 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 there's a fair amount of acknowledgement of healthcare disparities in your conversation. Again, we are all living uh, with these. 
Are there plans to implement or fund programs to decrease disparities? Because the same people that lack access to a PCP often lack access to reliable internet. How do we get the tools you're talking about into the hands of folks who may, you know, to, to even that playing field? Yep. The um, so so I I I think I'll give you an example of a way that we that we do that work. Um, we have a, an effort called Open Health Stack, which is um, a way that that our research teams have created a toolkit for um, NGOs, principally non-governmental organizations, to build applications for care delivery support. So, and the, the, the example there would be um, a, a group called Jacaranda Health in Kenya uses Open Health, used Open Health Stack to create an app that then is used on the Android phone by the community health volunteers supporting um, women across their, their pregnancy journey, so maternal health organization. So instead of the woman having to, the community health volunteer having to log, carry around a bunch of log books to do the documentation of the visit, now Dracoronda has an app that they can document right on the phone. So that's better for the caregiver. There's a continuity record. Um, and over time, um, there may be a way to start sharing that um, with the patients if that's what they, if that's what they want. The, the app is, um, the, the Open Health Stack toolkit is designed so that um, it works offline. So it doesn't, ha you don't have to be online. It's not going in the cloud, it's in the phone. Um, and, it, and it also works to, to um, be able to connect to um, the governmental evidence-based guidelines. So the, the most um, current guidelines can, can be embedded into the, the uh, app to support the caregiver to, again, bring that strong evidence right to the bedside, especially as, as things might evolve or change. That's an example of an organization using Open Health Stack. We have several countries around the world, particularly um, low and middle income countries where organizations are using this kind of technology, but but by design, it's for Android, which is um, for the some 3 billion people who have access to an Android phone, it's mostly low income individuals. It works backwards on phones, so you don't need the most modern phone system, and it's designed to work offline. So those are ways we think about equity by design and how we're going to be able to get tooling, you know, not to the, not to those who can afford it, but to the everyone um, er everywhere around the world. Um, that's very cool. And I was actually going to ask you about international kinds of global health applications. So you hit it right there. Um, Ted, do you want to ask your question, Dr. Johnson? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, in thinking about caregivers for persons living with dementia, they're a, such an essential part of the care team. Uh, yet our experience with caregivers is that they often believe that any um, sign of decline or symptom is related to some problem with the urine. And so it's a bacteria situation. If you look at the medical literature, it's pretty clear that unless there's criteria-based urinary tract infection, then that's not really the cause. And asymptomatic bacteria is often what we're finding. So we've got providers anchored in this one scientific literature. We've got caregivers anchored in this kind of caregiver and advocacy literature that says both the opposite. And just curious as to how there might be similar situations to that that you're trying to bridge and what recommendations that you have. Thanks. That's, that's a, a really interesting question. Um, and um, Ted, my, my mom uh, died of frontal temporal dementia and um, lived in a, a home with two other folks. So I spent a lot of time with her as a, as a daughter and uh, um, with, with those other folks watching um, the caregivers do their work every day, but also I'm um, sort of seeing how, seeing it through the lens of the non-physician. Um, I will say uh, with respect to Google, we don't have specific work in this area happening, but I think it's an example of how, um, how um, evidence can be brought into the hands of care teams. And I, by the way, I love that you're interpreting caregiver in just the way that we mean it. We do mean that, that broad circle. Um, but also, um, I think being able to personalize the, the, because there there may be some individuals when they get um, a UTI get a little dehydrated and their stroke some you know their prior stroke may cause them to lean a little bit right, and those are those are the kinds of things that a caregiver would notice um, pretty pretty rapidly more than the physician because the caregivers eating every meal with them and bathing them and everything else. So I think that that what where I would go with that is just thinking about how a system like Emory might want to um, take advantage of generative AI to think about um, learning from the experiences of the caregivers and the clinicians, um, and and um, also thinking about the fact that there's not a one going to be 
over time a one size fits all, but each individual patient may have a different way that they're affected and manifested. And um, th this is, I think sort of goes to a very a key point I wanna make, um, which is the opportunity at hand for generative AI is uh, um, quite broad. And, um, but I think that, that early on, uh, we, what we might think about doing is automating existing processes in healthcare, rather than thinking about new ways to integrate teams to deliver care, which is what I'm gathering from what you're saying. And I would just say, if you haven't read Bob Walker's paper that he just published in JAMA, it's so good. And um, I think he sort of speaks to this idea that this new technology gives us an opportunity to really rethink the way that we're meeting people and caregivers where they are, giving them tooling that that helps them, uh, you know, do the best for, for everybody. Okay, in our two minutes left, because I want to respect your time, I have one more question. So um, how should we feel and how should we counsel patients regarding the metadata collected by their searches and implications for personal health information privacy as Google Health and others are an increasing resource? Mm. So we, um, so, so these are one of the reasons that we have the three buckets, um, consumers, caregivers, and, and um, community is that information for consumers lives over there. When you search on things, um, it's anonymous. I'm not actually personally answering any of your questions. <laughs> I'm sort of, it's sort of, you know, uh, it's, it's automated. Um, and it's, um, we've been much more intentional, especially in the last couple of years about logs, um, given some of the the, cha the changes with Dobbs um, and, and sort of making sure that people understand from a privacy standpoint, what's being collected and what's not. So we're always every day seeking to make it more anonymous and private. In the caregiver bucket, when we work with an Emory or a healthcare system, that personal health information lives in the instance of cloud that is owned by the care team. We are not personally touching that as research teams. We do that with the, the healthcare system. And that personal health information doesn't feed back into the foundation models. It stays in that instance. It's incredibly important for folks to understand that. Um, that that those are those are del in very intentionally different spaces of, of work, and um, I, I think that the handoff of the of, uh, for if you take the the standpoint of your patient, they're looking for information, and they want to be able to do that in a way that is their space, and they may or may not want to share it, and we want to respect that, just like um, you all um, have or others have data that is in in your HIPAA you know confined instance, and that's where where it needs to to stay and live. I hope that answered the question. Oh, that answers it really well. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. We um, deeply appreciate your time to talk to us today. And it's, I think, um, given us, you know, uh, both a window into what's now, but a window into what's future as well. And like I say, it again warms, I think, probably all of our heart, how much um, you're focused on really everyone and everyone's health and that notion of life happens and uh, and um, having this happen with healthcare and not to healthcare. So Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you all for having me. And hello to all my friends. <laughs> Y'all have a good holiday. All right. Take care. Thank you.